Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm Ricardo Inverni, and I work at the IEA in the annual energy statistics team. Uh, today, I will present the electricity and heat module, uh, followed by some exercises. So, uh, firstly, I will talk about some key electricity, electricity trends, uh, some key concepts in uh, energy and electricity statistics, and of course, we'll have some time at the end for questions. So, let's start together with some key electricity trends. So, as you can see in this graph, this graph represents the evolution of world electricity production between 1974, when the IA was founded, and 2020. Over this period, world electricity production increased basically uh, every year, with the exception of 2009, following the economic crisis, and 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Overall, this resulted in a fourfold increase in the electricity production from roughly 6,000 terawatt hour in 1974 to about 20, uh, 27,000 terawatt hour in 2020. So now I have a little quiz for you. Uh, so let's go to our quiz platform, Menti. So the question is, what is the main fuel used for electricity, electricity generation in the world in 2020? So if you go to menti.com, you can use the code uh, that you can see. So 74955713, and you can answer this question. So I wait for your answers. Okay, I start seeing some answers for coal oil, hydro, okay, well, basically we covered all the fuels, we have answers for all the fuels, but we have a winner, which is coal, and Coal is the correct answer. So let's go back to the presentation. If we have a look to the graph of the, over this 46 year period, uh, the mix of fuels used to generate electricity changed. Uh, for instance, uh, if we look at the share of electricity from oil, we had some answers for, for oil in Menti, but as you can see, oil passed from a uh, uh, has fallen from about 25% of electricity generation share to less than 3% in 2020. And in a similar way, also the share of hydro decreased from uh, 23 to um, around 17% due to the fact that many of the suitable large scale sites have already been uh, done, of course. And by contrast, we can see uh, the share of production for natural gas, which is the light blue one, uh, increase significantly, uh, rising from 12% uh, to almost 24% of uh, generation. So it doubled in this uh, in this period. And there is also a noticeable increase in the production from uh, nuclear power. Uh, the yellow one, it's shaded in yellow. And its share uh, uh, increased from 4% in 74 to roughly 13% uh, in 2020. So uh, during this uh, time, you can notice uh, the answer we, we, we gave together, you gave. Um, so you can notice that coal still remains the main fuel used for electricity generation and with this uh, share changing uh, very little. And the main reason is uh, its relative cost advantage over other fuels. However, also on the emission front, uh, there is some good news because if you look at the share of electricity output from solar and wind uh, shaded uh, in orange and light green, a second from the top of the graph, um, you will see that even if the output of these renewable sources is still a relatively small share of the total output, uh, their share has been constantly increasing in uh, recent years. As production costs have fallen and also countries have begun to implement uh, more environmentally friendly policies. So in summary, to summarize, 
uh, in um, compared with 1974, the electricity mix has a lower share of oil and hydro, a higher share of natural gas, nuclear, uh, solar, and wind, and with the share of coal, uh, which remains a constant. Now let's have a closer look at data for electricity generation in uh, 2020. So as mentioned before, coal remains the dominant fuel, providing 35% of electricity generation, followed by natural gas, which provides 24%. And we have to consider that in total, uh, almost two thirds of all electricity generation comes from combustible fuels. So coal, oil, natural gas, biofuels, and waste. With the, rem the remaining third produced by non-emitting sources such as nuclear, hydro, solar, uh, wind, and uh, geothermal. So if we go to have a look to the world electricity production by region, uh, we can compare OECD countries and non-OECD countries. And as you can see, electricity production in non-OECD countries has grown much faster than in OECD countries over the past um, 20 years. So in particular, uh, production in non-OECD countries uh, surpassed OECD one in 2010, around 2020. So since then, the electricity production in non-OECD countries has continued to increase while production in OECD countries uh, has reached a plateau. And, and in 2020, the share of production of non-OECD countries is around 60%. Uh, compared to the one that was in 1974, which was around 30%. Then if we uh, disaggregate these non-OECD countries production by region, we can see a very interesting topic. So uh, much of this growth in recent years has been driven by China and other countries in, uh, in Asia. Now have a look to the electricity consumption by sector. And firstly, you can notice that consumption has increased four times between 74 and 2020, growing from uh, 5,000 terawatt hour to almost 23,000 terawatt hour. This is not so sur surprising at all, because if you remember a few slides back, we saw that also production increased fourfold. So of course it makes sense that consumption and production increased with the same trend. Uh, however, uh, the numbers are slightly different because if you remember, the production was 27,000 terawatt hour, while here the consumption is 23,000 terawatt hour. So what is the reason uh, for this gap? The reason are uh, the, um, transmission and distribution losses, which are around 7% of the production, and energy industry or news, which is around 9% of the, of the production. And looking at the consumption by sector, uh, industry is uh, the largest consuming sector followed by residential. However, we can also here distinguish between OECD countries and non-OECD countries uh, because uh, this is a word graph. But um, if we have a look, a closer look to the distinction between OECD and non-OECD countries, we can see that for OECD countries, three sectors, which are industry, residential, and commercial and public services consume uh, roughly the same amount of electricity demand, so around 30%. By contrast, analyzing non-OECD countries, industry represent, I would say, almost half of the total electricity demand. So there are many reasons for these differences, which are mainly the structure of the respective economies, income levels, um, but however, also, as, uh, as we said before, for the electricity, electricity production, uh, this trend also different for, from country to country. So uh, this was the trend modules. And now let's move into some key concepts in the reporting of electricity and heat uh, statistics. Uh, firstly, let's have a look at the source of, of electricity. Electricity can be produced both as primary and secondary energy. Primary electricity is obtained from natural sources, such as hydro, solar PV, wind, and um, tidal and wave energy. Secondary electricity is obtained from the heat generated by burning combustible fuels, 
from nuclear fission, from geothermal heat, and from solar thermal heat. Also heat can be produced as primary and secondary energy. Primary heat is obtained from, again, from natural sources. Natural sources are solar thermal, geothermal, and uh, nuclear. While secondary heat is obtained by burning combustible fuels and for, uh, from uh, transforming electricity into heat in electric boilers or by capturing heat from low temperature sources uh, using heat pumps. Now uh, let's make a distinction between two uh, different kinds of producers. This is um, by far one of the most important concepts of energy statistics because electricity and heat producers can be divided into two broad categories, which are main activity producers and auto producers. So main activity producers generate electricity and heat as their primary activity. So the main purpose of the facility is to generate, generate electricity or heat. For instance, um, a nuclear power plant is a perfect example of a main activity producer. On the other side for auto producers, auto producers generate electricity or heat only as a secondary activity. So uh, let's make an example. For example, a large chemical site may have a proper power plant to generate electricity and heat uh, to use them in, uh, in the production process. And some of these electricity or heat may be in excess and be sold. However, the main purpose of the plant, of the facility is to produce chemicals, not to produce electricity or heat. So this is why it's called auto producer. And to conclude, let me highlight that it's, it's important to note that this distinction between main activity producers and auto producers is based on the activity, on the primary activity of the facility, not on whether they are public or private companies. So um, there are, uh, we can distinguish between uh, main activity producers and auto producers, but we can also distinguish plants uh, in three categories. There are electricity only plants, which as the name suggests, only produce electricity. We have heat only plants, which again, only produce heat. And we have also combined heat and power plants or um, CHP plants, which can generate both electricity and heat uh, in a combined process. Now let's have a look, well, let's have a look uh, uh, at some uh, reporting conventions because we made this distinction between main activity producers and auto producers and between electricity only, heat only and CHP because we have different reporting convention according to every kind of different plant. So uh, for main activity producer, <laughs> the convention is <laughs> quite straightforward. So all production of electricity and heat must be reported. However, for auto producers, there are some specific conventions. So for auto producers, electricity only, all the production is reported. For auto producers heat, only the sold heat is reported. And for CHP auto producers, again, all the electricity production is reported and only the sold heat is reported. So let's make an example because I think it's uh, way more clear than uh, the theory. Uh, if we have uh, an auto producer, um, heat only auto producer producing uh, 100 uh, units of heat, uh, it sells 30 units. We have to report only 30 units of heat in the electricity questionnaire. And in a similar way, only 30% of the fuel inputs would be reported in a questionnaire. So in this way, the efficiency is not distorted because other way, uh, otherwise I would have a big input with a, just a partial output. The remaining 70% of the fuel inputs associated to this, um, to this heat will be reported in the appropriate questionnaire of the, the specific fuel, but the heat not sold is not reported anywhere. So this is really, really important. And another important concept is the distinction between gross and net production. Because we have gross production that refers to the total output of electricity or heat generated in a plant before it's used. But not all of these is used for productive purposes outside the power plant. Some of the electricity and the heat generated is used on site uh, at the power plant itself 
for lighting, heating, support, plant operation, etc. And this is called on use. So the remaining production that is left over after subtracting the on use is called net production. So uh, remember that for auto producers, production only refers to the heat sold. So if we put together this concept and the concept of on use, we can uh, like uh, uh, see together another reporting uh, convention, which is really important. Uh, which because we just said that for auto producer we only report the amount of heat sold, so not the total heat production. Uh, if we reason in this way, we cannot report the amount of heat used for own use. So we need to make an assumption on this. Again, as before, for main activity producer and auto producer, uh, it's quite simple since net production is the difference between gross production and uh, gross production subtracting on use, and we have net uh, production. But for auto producer, for the electricity only, no issues is the same, but for heat only and CHP, we need to make an assumption. And the assumption is that gross is equal to net. So we don't have any on use. This is basically because for auto producers, it's really difficult to distinguish between the heat used for on use and the heat used to support their plant operation. So this is really important. I hope uh, it was clear. Um, just to recap all the convention that we, we saw together uh, for heat produced by auto producer, there are different reporting conventions. We only report the heat sold and we assume that the gross is equal to the net. For main producers and auto producer electricity, uh, there are no particular conventions. So let's change uh, a little bit the topic because we, we, have, we have covered, I would say the tricky part of the presentation, which are the reporting conventions. So let's move on to have a look at the electricity and heat supply chain and some of the data that we collect in our questionnaire. So uh, on the side of the supply, we collect uh, fuel inputs to the electricity and heat generation. We collect gross production, on use, and net production. And we also collect data on uh, uh, pumped storage hydro, electric boilers, and heat pumps. And finally, we also collect data, uh, speaking always on the supply side, we also collect data on trade. So putting together all these data, there, there are all the data on the left side of the slide. We have the supply side of the electricity balance. Now, in between supply and consumption, the electricity travels along cables. So we have losses. And these data are also collected in the, in the questionnaires. So finally, on the right side of the slide, we have the final consumption, where we collect data on consumption across the various sectors, such as industry, transport, residential, agriculture, et cetera. So in theory, uh, the difference between the supply side and the final consumption side should be just the losses. However, in reality, since we collect data from the uh, supply side and from the final consumption side, which are different, uh, we also have um, some statistical differences. And to conclude, we also collect data uh, such as peak loads and capacity data, which can be really useful for electricity analysis. So to uh, examine in a little bit losses, um, a little more in detail on the magnitude of the losses that can be expected and on why there are these losses. Um, electricity travels through cables and transformers and some energy is lost on the way. Uh, much of this is lost in the form of heat as the electricity current flowing through the cables uh, raises the temperature. And this energy is lost and it's basically dissipated in the surroundings and it reduces the amount of energy that can reach the final destination. So to give you an estimation, uh, losses can be expected to be in the range between five and 15% of the total production. And of course, uh, quite obviously, if we have uh, uh, older grids, we, we can expect higher losses or we have more distributed grid. We have 
higher losses. Also, we have higher losses when there is a high rate of bypassing of the net. So basically theft of electricity. And <clears throat> let's make a comparison between the production and the final consumption, because as we said before, uh, the different uh, should be the, uh, the losses, but we also have the own use of the energy industry. So um, as we can see in this slide, the numbers are the same numbers we analyzed before in the previous slides, if you remember. So we have the production, which is around 27,000 terawatt hours, and we have the final consumption, which is around 23,000 terawatt hours. So what is the difference? We said before that the difference was losses and energy industry on use. This is correct, but just to give you an idea of the magnitude, uh, in total, about 16% of the total gross production, which is quite a sizable amount, is lost or used uh, out of the final consumption sector. Okay, and now I will talk about some uh, really interesting definition, which are efficiencies and capacity factors. And these are really useful because they can be really useful for statisticians in order to check the completeness and correctness of the data. So uh, efficiency, what is efficiency? Efficiency is calculated as the total gross energy produced by a plant divided by the energy content of the fuel used to produce it. So basically the output divided the input. And of course, this efficiency must be lower than 100% because you cannot create energy. And um, the expected uh, efficiency may vary depending on the fuel and the technology used. Uh, for example, uh, if, um, if we take, uh, I don't know, uh, combustible fuels, uh, combined cycle gas turbines are expected to have a higher efficiency than coal power plants. Uh, combined cycle can reach 50% of, uh, of efficiency. Efficiency must be calculated in energy units and you must use the same units for the inputs and for the output. So uh, please, if you use uh, tera terajoule for the output, you, can, you have to use terajoule also for the input and the same for gigawatt hour. And also please note that uh, for the input, um, it is calculated on an NCV basis. So NCV has to be used. And this is particularly important for natural gas because natural gas usually it's reported in uh, gross calorific value. So uh, efficiency can be useful, uh, can be a useful check for uh, statistics uh, because we can use our knowledge of expected or historic efficiencies uh, in order to check if the reported inputs and outputs uh, make sense. Uh, regarding trades, uh, unlike other fuels, we have some uh, differences in the convention uh, for reporting. Uh, because um, electricity and heat are reported on the basis of border crossed, so not origin and destination. So also transit is included. So for example, if there is an export of electricity from Portugal, uh, from Portugal to France through Spain, uh, this has to be reported in this way. Uh, Portugal reports export to Spain. Spain reports imports from Portugal and export to France, and France reports imports from Spain. So even if the trade is from Portugal to France, um, Portugal and France uh, don't report any trade uh, with each other. So this really differs from the convention used for other fuels. So please keep in mind. And there is one more key concept uh, in electricity statistics that is really useful. That is the difference between energy and power. So power is the rate at which energy is used. So we can say that power is simply energy divided by time. And while power is measured in watt, uh, energy is measured in joule. So one watt is equal to one joule per second. And I would like to focus just on the, um, like on the important distinction between watt hour and watt, because watt refer to power, while watt hours refers to energy. And this is uh, the last um, definition I would like to, to share with you. Um, I was speaking before about the capacity factor. So, in addition to production, consumption, and trade data, 
the electricity questionnaire also captures data on power plant capacities. Uh, in specifically speaking, uh, net maximum capacities, uh, which are the maximum power output that a power plant can produce on the last day of the year, so on the 31st of December of the reporting year. And these data are really useful for analysts uh, because um, they can be used for checking the data as we can compare actual reported production values with the maximum potential production to check if the data makes sense. So uh, the capacity factor is defined as the actual production divided the maximum potential production. Again, it has to be lower than 100% because a plant cannot produce more the, than the maximum potential production. And the maximum pot potential production is defined as the capacity of the power plant multiplied for the time. And if you are considering a capacity factor of one year, uh, for the time you have to consider 8,760 hours, which are the hours of one year. And also this capacity factor, also like uh, uh, efficiency, uh, it depends on the technology. Uh, for instance, if we take uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear plants, uh, they are expensive to build and therefore they are typically run as much as possible. Uh, so they will have a high capacity factor, around 90%, while solar PV, <clears throat> which does not run at night, basically, and also it's also weather dependent because it's, if, if it's raining, uh, it's not working. Um, they will have a lower capacity factor. So as statisticians, uh, in the same way we used efficiencies before, we can use both historical and expected capacity factor as a check on our data. So finally, some comments on uh, data collection and sources of data uh, before we, we move on to exercises. Um, as we, uh, with all the statistics, uh, data collection has costs uh, in terms of time, of course, in terms of money, but also in terms of opportunity costs. Because please remember, it should be kept in mind that not having the proper information available uh, may, um, may lead to higher costs in uh, uh, decision making. Uh, in terms of specific challenges for electricity statistics, we have to mention the um, liberalization of the market uh, that had an impact, of course, because previously when there were monopolies, all the electricity data could be gathered from one company, but now data needs to be gathered from many different companies, some big, some small. So uh, in addition also, these companies, there is competition between these companies and competition leads companies to be uh, reluctant to share their data and also to confidentiality issues. So this can impact a lot data coverage and completeness. And of course, similar to other fields, uh, resource limitation in statistical offices and high staff turnover can cause data quality to, to suffer. Um, in, uh, in terms of data collection, the objective is to have detailed and reliable data on the different parts of the production and consumption. Um, and for it, we need a mature and sustained energy statistics system. So to facilitate this system, we should establish a legal basis, establish a proper reporting mechanism in the form of questionnaires, which have to be as user-friendly as possible, a network of contacts, an agreed timetable, and we also need to establish proper dissemination mechanism uh, to allocate proper resources to collect and process the data, and to review methodologies and processes in order to anticipate and adapt to change in the energy situation. And uh, since we are talking about data, data collection, what are the types of data collection? Uh, firstly, there are surveys. So uh, countries can administer surveys with energy suppliers or end users. And energy companies include power producers, transmission and distribution system operators, market operators, or um, electricity exchange. And on surveying energy companies, uh, we can gather information on the amount of, of electricity and heat they produce and eventually sold in the market. These data uh, are usually uh, quite easy to be tracked because companies, for the companies, they are essential for their um, accounting processes. 
um, surveys on enterprises, on the other hand, provide the advantages of uh, obtaining detailed information on the amount of electricity and heat consumed in a particular sector. So uh, in particular, surveying enterprises is helpful in capturing electricity production by auto producers. And um, to conclude, household surveys, uh, to conclude the surveys, <laughs> household surveys provide comprehensive information on the type of specific end use of electricity in the household, for example, space and water heating, lighting, cooking, etc. And even if the, the data gather are extremely comprehensive, um, these surveys have some issues because they usually present high correspondent burden and they are also time consuming and normally expensive to, to administer. A second source of data that we use are administrative data. So these are data collected primarily for non-statistical purposes, usually for implementing programs and policies and that are adopted for producing statistics. Uh, so um, to make an example, um, energy regulators have information on the type and capacity of issued licenses for power plants uh, or transmission system operators. Uh, <clears throat> have information on the amount of electricity passing through their network, or again, custom offices, et cetera. We can also gather data via direct measurement. So there are some variables that are better measured rather than surveyed. Uh, for instance, um, quick example, the energy consumption uh, can be collected by smart meters. Uh, they can provide the up-to-date information. And finally, uh, estimation and modeling um, allow data to be quantified when actual measurements are not uh, are not available. So uh, they provide uh, quick results and can act uh, as a substitute to reduce the frequency of expensive surveys. Uh, but its result is highly dependent on the accuracy of the model and on the input data. And an example of this is the, for example, for solar, uh, solar PV plants, if the actual electricity production is missing, if we have the solar PV capacity and we have a model solar radiation value of the, of the location, we can use them to obtain an estimate of the electricity generated by solar PV plants.